Good day, everyone. We are back, and we are having a beautiful discussion regarding a topic which can come as an SAQ. Uh, but today we are going to talk about it because this is a part and parcel of every registrar's life, and every FASM has gone through this. And we hope uh, the points we are going to raise in this podcast will help everyone. I am Kishan Ajampur, and my co-host. Uh, this is Abra again, back um, with you. And yeah, as Kishan introduced us, um, it's a very important part in a trial and a rite of passage to becoming a FASM is managing a night shift and how are you going to manage a busy department. And we thought we'd introduce this as an SAQ because it's never been asked in the FASM exams, as far as I know, uh, about how to actually manage night shift. They've all had uh, focuses on you know, managing a department in the daytime or something happens or a disaster exercise or something happens with radiology, but it's never really been something that focused specifically on managing a shift. So I think this is uh, an important SAQ. It is also important uh, towards becoming a FASM because uh, the first taste you get of department management is on a night shift. And uh, if you can manage a night shift in a very efficient manner, you will then be able to manage day shift in an efficient manner when you're doing a shift report or maybe if afterwards when you become a consultant, you'll realize that it's it's it's, it's, it's a day-to-day life thing. And so management of a night shift in a busy ED is a very good skill to have. Uh, and uh, as Abra pointed out, uh, he, has, he has been through this and he has his own tips and technique to deal with this and we're just going to go through a few of things, what we can, uh, h- how we can manage uh, ED efficiently. So I think we, uh, the way I think of this kitchen is the management of the night shift or a run of nights starts even before you actually step foot in the hospital. And it starts when you first go in, it starts with the, what the department looks like and what your plans are even before you take handover. So. I think uh, that's an important thing to mention. And uh, the main thing is when you present to the shift, what is you know what are the features you're looking for? We'll talk specifically about certain things, but I have uh, given a bit of an overview in the document that's going to come out with this is to say, I think of it as individual patients. I think of it as the whole department, the state of the whole department, the state of the whole hospital, the staffing levels of the ED, the supervision that you may or may not need to actually provide and the communication. So those are my broad sort of categories. Yeah, those are uh, very good broad categories, Abrar. As you said, uh, it all starts the minute you step into the department and uh, before you even take handover. Then uh, I, I don't know how you go about it, but uh, what I do is basically ask the, the, the manager, nurse manager there, Enam, uh, what are the suggestion of the bed in the hospital and uh, how are the bed situation in ED currently? Whether are we bed blocked? Is the waiting room full? And ask them if there are any sick patients in the department. And more importantly, ask them if there are any sick staff and we are short staffed. Yeah, that's true. And I think uh, everybody has their own style as well. And uh, Staffing is what sort of can often make and break the way the night shift goes. And I think it's not just the numbers in staffing, Absolutely. but it's the skill mix in staffing as well that makes a difference. I think we all have had night shifts where we've had another senior registrar with us and the night shifts just flow like a breeze. Yes, and, uh, yes that's true. Up. I think my best run of night shifts has been with you, uh, <laughs> with uh, both of us being on surprisingly together. And those were some of the best night shifts I've ever had. And I think I've heard similar sentiments from other senior registrars who've done shifts with other senior registrars. So I think that level of seniority and skill mix is really important. And that level of trust is very important. Absolutely. Uh, and of course, uh, with, with all these things, I also, we need to mention that the seniority and skill mix of the, the doctors are important, but equally more important is the seniority and skill mix of the nursing staff who are running the recess. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think 
you learn over time, you know, the, to rely on the nurses, especially the very experienced nurses, to actually bring to your attention areas in the ED that are approaching sort of disaster mode. Yes. And they can right. recognize the unwell patients really early on. They can tell you of that potential code gray before it even happens. They tell you about the the unwell child that needs to be moved from one area to the ED to the other. I Absolutely. Think they're just sort of valuable, your eyes and ears on the floor. We need to understand that they spend more time with the patient than we do. Yeah. And so they have a better understanding of the the timeline a patient has gone through, whether the patient is going to you know, go down the bad pathway or not. So yeah, definitely. These things are important to pay attention to when you walk into the shift. And so you look at the roster and see who is working with you and uh, how you're going to manage and delegate the staff to the appropriate uh, department or by the appropriate sites of the you know, ED. Yeah. And so sorry. If you, had to, if you had to mention key steps to managing night shift in the ED, Let's go through some key steps, Kishin, that sure. we can list maybe eight or nine key steps. And this could potentially be easily an SAQ question in admin. Yes. As a consultant, you come on to overcrowded department and a busy department, lots of sick patients. Can you please mention uh, eight or nine key steps? Yeah, to... so I think uh, what we got to do is when we're doing night shift, we all know that we are not staffed in the same number of staffing as the day shift. And the inpatient in it also are not to staff the same manner. And so our priority should be to manage critically ill patients first and then avoid solving non-emergent problems. Yeah, that's so true. We should not focus our mind and spend a lot of time and energy into a, a problem which does not need to be solved immediately and can be solved in the daytime. And yeah. so that is very important. And ensure that we communicate with our patient and staff uh, in a in a timely manner. So keep up to keep our uh, ANUMs up to date with what's happening in the department. It's very important. Sometimes what I'd like to do is uh, in at least do two kind of ward rounds with the ANUM in the middle of night, and uh, ensure that we both know what patient is going where and what's been happening and updating them. And what that does it is the nurse then knows, the floor manager knows what's happening with the patient and she'll be able to manage the floor more efficiently. And if you're having some trouble making room for different patients, then that will help the floor manager to give you, uh, you know, a space and choice to manage patients when you would yourself have difficulty in finding the bed for them. Yeah, they can often get things done a lot faster than you can uh, because they will have uh, proven ways of getting things happening and getting things moving. And they can sort of, it's almost like a jigsaw puzzle. Absolutely. Um, and, and you need to know when to delegate stuff. You know, you cannot do everything yourself because if you start doing everything yourself, I'm sure everyone can do it, but just going to take the entire night shift doing just, you know, stuff which you don't need to do which brings yeah. me back to the first point, do not do things which are non-emergent. Yeah, and I think when we talk about that, uh, do not do things that are non-emergent, we have to remember that we also say, you know, the key sort of things where, you know, don't order any tests that will change, will not change the management of the patient. Absolutely. You know, and avoid investigations that could be done elsewhere or, or from the ward. The patient doesn't always need to have a CT scan before it, like before they're transferred up to the ward, for example. Yeah. And it's important to embrace diagnostic uncertainty. And I think that's an important feature of emergency medicine that we are the masters of embracing diagnostic uncertainty and we can we sort of operate well under pressure in that. And I think sometimes it's not realistic to know why this person has this, um, this presenting problem. And not every condition needs to have a foolproof packaged diagnosis. And those days where you have, were making referrals to say, I've got this and this is my diagnosis. Well, that died in 1985. So <laughs> look, one of, one of my very old mentors did mention to me there are only two reasons for patient to be admitted to hospital. One is, you know what's wrong with the patient and you want to treat it. And two is you don't know what's wrong with the patient and you want to find it. 
exactly. Yeah, that's exactly right. So I think that sort of thinking, I'm glad that people are embracing that a lot more. I think as a specialty, I think we have to actually spread that with them a lot more to our senior registrars, our junior registrars as well. And I think that's important. And now, so you were talking about um, communication with, uh, with, yes, with staff. Yes, with staff. And the staff is not just the staff of ED. We need to deal, you know, uh, as a part of ED, we, we are the best communicators as far as I can see. So we need to communicate with our inpatient teams professionally as well and uh, ensure that we keep them in good spirits and uh, help them whenever, wherever we can because in turn they will help us whenever we need to. Yeah, and I think that concept of uh, it's important to put out that emergency medicine is often the caretaker or the purveyor of knowledge within an organization. We know what the protocols are, we know what the rules are, and oftentimes the other teams move in and out, and you know there might be a new registrar or new uh, new intern, but we sort of have that organizational value in knowing what are the processes, and especially for patient flow. So it's important to actually reinforce that. That's true. Um, and of course, as you said, patient flow, which is one of the important things we need to do in a night shift to ensure that the patient flow is maintained and we don't get bed blocked in ED because then that will then impact on the day shift. Uh, and you don't want to come to a ED which is completely filled with inpatient uh, referred patients rather than admitted patients and with no plans whatsoever. So we want to ensure that the patient flow continues. And, and uh, um, sorry, yeah, sorry. I was saying, Kishan, that most EDs now have uh, an, ele- an, ex- an electronic, either a note taking system or an electronic monitoring system. We have FirstNet, but we also have an electronic monitoring system, which is an ED dashboard that gives you an idea of how long certain investigations are taking, how quickly you know registrars or interns are seeing patients, and how many patients are waiting, and how many patients are waiting longer than four hours, and all of that sort of data that's important to have at your fingertips. Yes, it's, it, it is important and it helps us manage our patient flow very well. And um, when you're managing patient flow, we should not forget that you should manage your own time and the uh, rest of your team. Make sure they take adequate breaks, make sure they are well fed and uh, you yourself need to take care of yourself. One of the things which I do Oh, well, I used to when I don't do as many nights as I used to. I would do was I would buy everybody coffee and dinner at my night shift. And uh, what that does it is we know food makes friends. And when you feed your staff, they will work extra hard for you. (laughs) And uh, and obviously don't forget uh, caffeine as well. Of course, that's what food and coffee that makes your life uh, happy. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, yeah. and makes your staff work extra hard for you. Yeah, and I think it's uh, it's an important feature because I think it's uh, it allows you time to recharge. You know, you eat and you drink, you tell some jokes, and you have you have a. I think that it's all part of the personality of a department. I think a happy atmosphere means that you can actually band together and you can actually get through some very difficult times. And I think. It's uh, it's an important sort of thing to actually not like not forget to have breaks. I, I I can't believe that you know you know many years ago I used to do runs or night shifts and I wouldn't even take a break. And I think that was not very healthy. And it's a thing that I've actually fought quite hard in, within myself to institute. You know to actually force myself to go and have a break and make sure my you know I would look after everybody else but not look after myself. So I think looking after your staff and yourself is very important. Yeah, that is true, and and as and I said, if you have a laugh at the you know in the middle of night, you and you're keeping everybody happy, they, you know, the morale is high, and yeah. doesn't matter how tough the shift is, how difficult the patients are, and how sick the patients are, it all becomes a very smooth sailing. Yeah, that's true. We've had some really di- uh, difficult nights, all of us. I think no one can say they've had you know easy nights all the time. So, and I think what really may makes a difference is the people, and uh, that break time and that sort of morale is very important. Absolutely. Um, and as I said, we already mentioned we need to make sure that we delegate our staff at, uh, appropriately. You know, we can't have the most junior person running a short stay, all by themselves in charge of you know twenty odd patients. It uh, it is not good for their 
confidence and it is also unsafe for the patient. Uh, and you should ensure that you check on them. If it is, if there is no choice but to send the junior most person there, you need to ensure that there are good plan for the patient in short stay and you keep an eye on them by doing virtual rounds, calling them, you know, as often as you can to make sure that everything is going good. Uh, yeah. And you should uh, foremost make ensure that there are all the staffs are safe. Because we know that we come across certain patients who are uh, who require security personnel to be present uh, for appropriate treatment. Um, so yeah. in those circumstances, we want to ensure that staff are kept safe. And also, uh, those people should not be seen by the junior staff. So don't send an intern in to see the patient with the management plan, which has uh, um, alerts for aggression and inappropriate behavior. So I think it's That's important your uh your m- most most experienced person on the team to go and see them and if it's you then well then you have to make time to see the patient absolutely. absolutely um so these are the few points i think are important to know when you're going to start your night shift and now i also want to touch on something that we don't do very often in australia but it's been investigated i think is the use of scribes and um i think you have some experience in this way you know on some particularly difficult shifts we've yeah. used turn and we've gone in that's not the best use of have, having an intern but remember interns are super numeric so Absolutely. if they do uh, do a shift with your hmo or junior person it's sometimes a good idea to have them scribe with you and go around i think that's something we should think about doing more often yeah i've employed this many a time when we come onto a shift where there are numerous patients waiting to be seen and what we need is uh, a quick plan for many of these patients wherein uh, uh, you are the most senior person on the shift and uh, being the most senior you will be able to make the decision quicker than anybody else yeah. but then you also need to ensure that they have adic- ad- you know adequate documentations have taken place for these patients so yeah. what i do in certain circum- those circumstances is i s- get the most junior person which is going to be an intern uh, and uh, ask them to come around with me with the patient i go take the history take do the exam and the intern then documents all these things and the thing is with the electronic documentation the current brand of you know the breed of doctors they are so good at typing that they can type as we talking and so by the time i finished examining and taking history and examining the patient the document is ready the plan is ready and which a uh, patient which might take uh, an intern or a, another junior doctor half an hour 45 minutes to do we can do that in half the time and that way i would go through numerous patients without having to actually document much and then of course uh, the doctor can then follow up and ensure that all the plan happens this speeds up the process this also ensures that uh, all the patients who are sick they get their plan done at in a timely manner uh, yeah so i, I think it's a great thing to use i don't use it quite often i use it when there is definitely need for it well uh, they do that for the inpatient units so um, you know why don't we use them in ed is my theory so i think uh, it's one of those things of the um, that's what they spend the internship doing as well so we can use them in emergency as well now another thing that I want to talk about was dealing with the admitting teams or inpatient units and um, in a professional manner and i think that's important uh, a few key things that i do want to talk about is how how would you you know do that well my feeling is i think we should try to get to know the admitting units and inpatient units and a lot of the times that's just a bit of um, getting to know them both in and out of work that that helps and it makes things run a bit more smoothly and communication as well i think communicating with them clearly very early on on bed issues and bed block is a very important feature I, I, and i don't think we do that too often in night shift and i think it's important because it's important to make the inpatient units also understand that bed block in ed is not just ed's problem it's the whole of hospital's problem and approach that's required and uh, yeah and a consultation request i think need to be very clear and i think when you speak to the surgical registrar for example or the obstetrics and gynecological registrar it's important to 
be clear and be and they have to be appropriate and you have to insist on that sometimes and you shouldn't delay the referral when it's very obvious and my uh, bugbear is appendicitis when it's uh, very clinically <laughs> appendicitis well you just admit that like you know there's no need to do an ultrasound there's no need to do blood tests immediately to do all the sort of things to actually you know get the bed arranged document the time of referral and admit the patient and do all the right things, give them analgesia, give them anti-emetics, antibiotics once, you know, your, your diagnosis is clear. And I think if you have any issues, you really need to learn to pick up the phone and speak to the, the consultant of that unit. And now speaking to the consultant of that unit, if you don't get love from the registrar is important. But the other point that I think you wanted to make was we should involve our own um, in charge and our consultants as well. So would you like to talk on that a bit? Yeah, I think uh, uh, we, uh, like, you know, other departments, they speak to the consultants at any time they think is needed. It doesn't, the time is of no value to them. So it's a 1 a.m., 2 a.m., they speak to the consultant because the consultants themselves want to know all these things. Our consultants also want to know other things, but there is a kind of a, feeling in I think amongst registrar that it's, it's looked down upon if you call a consultant I think they like to I think I know that uh, you you tend to have this feeling that well you know I want to be seen as independent and you yeah. know if I call my consultant on call um, then it's a sign of weakness but it's actually not I think it's a it's actually a strength to Absolutely. know ask for help and I think um, all of our consultants in our department would definitely like to be called about any issue that um, the registrar in charge at night is facing because we don't want them we don't want them to struggle alone and we also want to provide them support and that's why we are on call we get paid to be on call yeah and i personally you know I, I never and i know all of my colleagues would agree with this we do not have any problems with the registrars ringing us in the middle of the night at any point in time because to us patient care is important and also the the well-being of the registrars is important as well yeah, and I think, uh, as you mentioned, there is no consultant who would say, do not call me in the middle of night because uh, on the, in the end, it is the well-being of the patient. And yeah. uh, and another point I want to make about you know, how to deal with the inpatient unit who are having difficulty in listening to you or the admission, I start off with saying, look, this is, I'm an advocate for the patient. And, yeah. And, and, the well-being of the patient is most important. I understand that they may not have the same opinion as me regarding the management of the patient, but in the end, is the well-being of the patient important? And then I speak to them that both of us probably agree that patient needs admission. The unit and the timely admission is now secondary. Once we both come to an agreement that the patient needs to be admitted, we can then cross the border and see where exactly they'll be admitted. But that's how we need to you know, manipulate their thought process as well. And uh, overall, I have found that inpatient units is spoken to uh, properly and given the appropriate referral, they don't have any issues admitting the patient. So in the end, it's all about advocacy for the well-being of the patient. And I think it's important because uh, it's uh, it's really something that, you know, we have to help them help themselves and also help them help us. And I think everybody has different pressures and especially in this era of covid you know, everybody's stressed and I think we, everybody should do our best. And, but, you know, remember that patient care is something that we have to keep foremost and, and, uh, and at the front. And it's important that we do advocate for our profession to say, well, emergency uh, physicians have to deal with uncertainty and quite a few problems concurrently. We don't just have the one patient and uh, we can't, and we don't know everything. And I don't think we need to know everything and we shouldn't be solving every single problem for every single patient, but, we need to identify, you know, which patient needs what investigation and management yep. and what time they need them. And we need to actually process them through the system to provide them the flow and the access to the treatment that they need. Absolutely. Um, so uh, but these are the few points we actually think it's yeah. good. Uh, this was a general cast from us. I think this is something that would help you answer an admin question on the written fellowship exam. And also this will be helpful for your OSCE exam as well. And I yeah. think the, the topic- Can I point out one thing though? I forgot, we, I think we important. should mention this, that uh, in a busy night shift when we are like, you know, obviously the, the 
the dreaded night shift of when you're short staffed and your bed blocked uh, yeah we need to understand that there are there, there are other doctors in the d- hospital who can help us if there is a sick patient there are the icu doctors who can give us a hand yeah that's uh, right and, and if there are medical patients who are sick the physician trainees are also an appropriate you know a very good source of knowledge if you're running short of you know you can't understand what's happening you should not have any hesitation in speaking to these people and asking their second opinion you don't have to ask them say look i have a referral for you to admit a patient but you can just call them and say look i don't know what's wrong with this patient can you help me diagnose this patient yeah and i think that asking for help the same way should also extend to other areas you often have an operations director in emergency department on call you have the executive you have the psm or the bed manager so i think escalation of overcrowding and escalation of patient management needs to happen at multiple levels and needs to happen early absolutely and and we should not hesitate for asking for help yeah all right uh, kishan so that was a good cast i think we will uh, i think we had to do something like this we haven't done an admin cast for some time so i think it's important to get this going but uh, we hope you enjoyed listening and it will help you in some way with your thinking process and managing your next night shift um thanks very much for listening thank you and we will be back soon have a great day thank you bye